Our last speaker for today is the Ruckus himself. Kondi is called so, the Ruckus by industry, colleagues, and stakeholders. He works globally with leaders and high-impact individuals to reach deeper dimensions of meaning, purpose, global influence, and continued relevance. His skills have served individuals, families, organizations, and governments across the globe, including Fortune 500 companies such as Coca-Cola, Microsoft, Total, and Shell. Mr. Kunle has, does work through his thought-led consultancy and strategy sessions, his one-on-one -on -one clarity and growth sessions, as well as the global republic community of doers. He's happily married to his beautiful and gifted wife, Tiwa, and they are blessed with a son, and they live in the United States. Please welcome once again to the platform. Okay, please, you may be seated. God bless you. Um, it's been very interesting listening to all the speakers. Very instructive. I've been really blessed, empowered on many levels, directed, instructed. Um, um, so I should actually thank Pastor Poju for coming out of his way 15 years now. Um, driving this conversation, pulling it together, and helping us to see, you know, vistas that are necessary for how we think, how we govern behavior. It's working, you know. Um, I have the privilege of joining around the world and meeting with thought leaders and strategists at different levels. And, you know, platform continues to be one of those environments that spark, you know, um, ideas for a lot of people across the world um, thinking about our country, thinking about our continent, you know, and making decisions uh, based on flashes of ideas that come from this platform. I really want to appreciate everyone in here, um, Pastor Poju, um, Pastor Mrs. Toi Oyemade, thank you so much for all that you represent. Um, Covenant Nation, uh, thank you all for your support for this vision and making it work. God bless you real good. Um, if you have time, uh, thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. If you have time after the um, um, session, you, please, I would like, ask you to visit my stand. I have some products there that are useful for you. I always go with my products anywhere because my products are more important than me. They, 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 they travel where I cannot go. They stay more with people more than I can stay with them. They are more transferable and usable than I can ever be and they will definitely outlive me. So I'm not committed to my products and I'm committed to myself. So find time to go there and see what you have. They are very expensive, I'm not sorry. You know, I mean, it's not for everyone, but you will find something there. I also have a program that I'm driving, Big Swings, The Rise of Underdogs. Go there and see. Um, I co-authored a great book that has been number one on every platform in the United States, from um, Wall Street Journal to Amazon to Barnes & Noble, to USA Today bestseller. I mean, number one on day one of release, incredible book published by Forbes Books. I'm going to ask that you check it out. You know, for a very long time, nobody could assess it in Nigeria. You know, and people have been screaming, but finally we got a breakthrough. So if you visit kuramo.com, I just thought I should put that out here. Kuramo being Q-U-R-A-M-O, kuramo.com. You can now have the book in Nigeria, right? So do that. God bless you as you do so. Again, I really want to thank Pastor Poju and Pastor Tony for their love, for um, asking me to do this again. I really felt really blessed and, you know, um, encouraged. The last time I was here on the platform and I'm here again, I find it very, very accepting, you know, and I, I say that humbly. Thank you very much, right? So, the assumption is that when it's darkest, um, it's about to get better, you know, but under certain assumptions and dynamics that are flawed on many levels, that will be true most times, not all the times. At some times, depending on some assumptions, when it's darkest, then everything's about to come to nothing, right? That's pretty much like saying when the going gets tough, 
the tough gets going. It will be true most of the time. But that is assuming that the tough knows his way. Because when the going gets tough, depending on the conditions, the tough cannot just keep going because it can get lost. So the tough must seek collaboration. And I can't almost have any thought of any kind without thinking about collaborations. I know exactly what it means for today's people. Um, there are so many ideas in the world today that people are not paying attention to. One of them is the death of death. I was speaking to a pastor the other day who had big plans for a healing crusade in the next 10 years. And the healing crusade is going to be based on some things. And I told him, there is no healing in the future. Just in case you don't know. Um, there's no healing in the future. Now, when I say there's no healing in the future, I don't mean people will not be healed. People will not be sick. Just like when we left the Stone Age, stone did not finish in the world. There are still so many stones. We just found better ways of doing things. So, there is a book that you may want to check. It's called The Death of Death. That is, and the book is a very bold assertion. First of all, the author believes he's not going to die, and I accept his sentiments because it makes sense. Um, but part of it is that by 2045, death will be optional in the world. Somebody I know is sick uh, of a particular disease. I told him to hang in there because in another seven years, tops, 10 years, the, prop, the part of your body you have a problem with will be 3D printed. So if you can just hang in there and fight for another seven years, you will live. You know, this does not require anybody praying for you. If you have prayer points, pray for the scientists working on it. Scientists working on it. Because that would make a lot of difference. And if God meets you there today and heal you, fantastic. Jesus did not heal one disease in the Bible that doctors could heal. There was not one. Go check it. Every healing in the Bible were things that defy the logic, the intelligence, and the science of medicine and the protocols that define it. And common sense is the gift of God to the human condition. The idea that God does not make a demand where he has not invested. And that the human brain is God's creative art to invest in man for his own automated behavior. That is, he can now begin to curate his own experiences at the speed of preference. It has changed the world, guys. Gave us merchant banking. Built the pyramid. Did incredible things in the world. Gave us the internet. Flew the plane in the sky. Do you know how heavy a plane is? It's not plugged to any wires. It's not connected. It's not held down by it. Just, just human beings arresting gravity, jailing matter, and putting things at a level that pretty much give us power to prove that of all human species, the gift of reasoning is the most superior that actually separates city from jungle. That's the question. If a lion can ask himself why he has a lot of hair, he will shave. The reason why the lion has not shaved is because he really cannot pause and say, why do I have so much hair? Is this my design? That the lion is like that, honestly, is not necessarily designed. It's because of the absence of a deeper quality, which is the ability to self-question, to question himself, to question his environment. There's so many things religion has done to this world that will take us a long time to recover from. The good news is that religion as we know it has a lifespan of another 50 years. Tops. You will argue with me, you can punch me. Don't punch me, just wait and hope you live long enough to see it. But religion is not in the future. Don't get me wrong, faith will expand. Spirituality will grow. But religion as you know it will crack. It can't survive the freedom of Gen Z and Gen Alpha. They are actually going to question everything and puncture every lie out of everything we have put together in an attempt to arrest God, not to offer freedom. Because that's what religion does. Am I speaking to you? The next level of colonization will be voluntary. Nations are by themselves going to surrender to other nations and say, colonize us. We really cannot handle our reality again. It happened in the Bible. 
and then before you punish me for the Bible, it happened in 1965. The nation of Malaysia was a bigger nation. The nation of Singapore was a smaller country struggling. And Singapore went to Malaysia to say, absorb us as a state in Malaysia. We can no longer handle our realities. Stretch your map to include our own. Maybe our prime minister will become a governor. And our governor will become a local government chairman or a mayor of some sort. But we can no longer define our realities. And the merger happened. I'm going somewhere. And when that merger happened, Singapore began to struggle as much as his helper was struggling, Malaysia. Malaysia felt absorbing a poor Singapore was only going to make them poorer. So what did they do? They broke the merger and then abandoned Singapore. Then a young man came into the picture. His name was Lee Kuan Yew. And Lee Kuan Yew did only three things. Fought communism to death, invested in the mass education of his people, and then invested heavily in enterprise education. 30 years after, Singapore became a first world country with a per capita income higher than that of its colonial masters, Britain, till today. Probably the only country in the world that is attracting naturalization from Americans. And not just from any American, but from billionaire Americans, including the co-founder of Facebook. The idea is that the human mind has the freedom and the right to paint pictures of his own preference, to deliberately talk his own prejudice in and create that picture at the speed of choice, at the speed of preference, even with the power to clock in time on it. People have done it. They've done it without the privilege of church or mosque. Some of the richest people in the world don't go to church. In fact, Bill Gates, of the allocation of resources, religion is a waste of time. You can't judge him. The richest man in the world for how many years? If you have more money, question what it is. If you don't have more money, you shut up. It's as simple as that. So there is another way that I've considered that we have to be thinking. There's just another way we have to begin to look at things. And I think that two things that is needed in the world at any point in time, in any environment, for development to really occur will be wisdom and courage. Wisdom is not intelligence. Intelligence can rob a bank. It, in fact, it takes a lot of intelligence to rob a bank successfully. Intelligence can plan to rape your wife. Intelligence can steal your money. Wisdom only multiplies good. So you can have very intelligent people who are very foolish. And foolishness is not an insult. It's a state of existence. It means that there is a set of behavior and thinking that conforms to a definition. So you can't call a carpenter a surgeon. I will say this thing every time I have the privilege of a microphone. Because there are handsome fools. There are six foot tall, broad chested, empty minds. They are very pretty, wig wearing drifters. There has to be another way we define people beyond container and recognize that before container, there's a stronger force called content. But content has no color. What's the address of wisdom? What kind of car does understanding drive? Where, what kind of shoes does prudence wear? You don't see these things, but these things govern our entire existence on a daily, every day. So, Nigeria needs wisdom. Nigeria needs courage. But I'm not very big on worrying about politicians and political parties. I've done my research. I've not found or transformed by its politicians. I've not found one. I've not found one country that was solely transformed by its government. I've realized that at the end of the day, the government and its politicians are at the mercy of a few rebels and when i say rebels i don't mean people carrying guns because violence violence is the deepest appreciation of weakness and so you have to be bigger right and I, i'm talking about people who pay attention to mental weaponry for revolution right a type of strength that is not commonplace you don't go to school. You know, somebody told me something has to be done 
and people have to be coached at a particular level and people have to qualify for something and people have to go to a particular school to be able to do this and then they have to qualify and then I said calm down the first person that certified people who certified him the first person that said this is what is called a accounting degree who taught him that or the first person that said you are now certified to be this type of person who certified that person knowledge doesn't have to be received horizontal to horizontal knowledge first of all is vertical that is we can move from zero to one defining knowledge by one to infinity is oppressive that is paying attention to their privileges of some people as the only way to grow knowledge and to grow power we can change that the moment you begin to understand that a new type of strength comes into you to accept that you can question everything the americans did it have you ever wondered that the americans play american football they play um the, the basketball but when they are playing those things they call it world series and when they win the world series they say they've won the world cup except that there's no nation playing with them it's just them it doesn't make sense logically but nobody's questioning it that is the boldness of a people to say this is who we are this is what we do and this is how we serve it and you have no choice but to accept it or to leave us to play our world it's as simple as that and so one of the greatest things we've lost as a people is that the white man came here and i don't mean the white man of 2022 i don't mean the white man of the 2000s at all i don't even mean the white man of the 21st century but a white man in our history, the white man of slave trade, the white man of colonialism, came here, took away our education, and gave us the classroom. And the classroom has become a major deal. All kinds of enterprises are happening because of the classroom. I have less than 10 minutes more. God help me. So you then have people defining meaning, preferences, outcomes, all kinds of qualifications by the limits of the classroom and it has not helped because academics is what you are taught at best education is what you teach yourself to education we must turn superior to education is revelation because that's what you are given and that is not curated within the human space but education is enough to transform societies it has happened again and again right so what is education the right of the human spirit to do four things. Number one, to experience his world freely. Number two, to question it deep enough. Number three, to find the options that exist in it. And number four, to know which of those options to embrace as a matter of supreme importance and urgency. I'll say it again. Education is the freedom, the right of the human spirit to experience his world, to question it deep enough to find the options that exist in it and to know the ones to embrace as a matter of supreme urgency. By that definition, so many people in school with PhDs are not educated. They have passed the test of the technicality of academics, but they fail that of essence, which is education, because they cannot experience their world, even with a PhD. And when they can experience their world, they can question the world they are experiencing. And when they can question that world, they cannot birth options through that. And when they can birth options, they don't know they want to choose as a matter of supreme importance and obviously because confusion is not a psychological state. It's the inability or refusal of someone to take a decision in the face of options. So when you have options and you don't know you want to choose, then you are confused. It's not ignorance, right? So we need to prioritize education. We need to find, emphasize education above academics. And this education has to be informal, right? And there must be another way we have to begin to look at it, to teach our people to essentially understand how to birth options. Their courage is to legislate that. For example, to take a second look at Ligua Franca, this English I am speaking, very few of us in this country, when you aggregate the value, can do it as good as I'm doing it. And I'm not the best doer of these things. There are a vast majority of people who cannot do to any degree of what I'm doing right now and those people are going to work with you or work for you at different levels right they are the ones that are going to listen to you right listen to your politicians and they are going to make the vote not your vote how many of us are educated on social media really of all the Nigerians how many of us are on social media 
So the guys who are going to listen to the campaigns, to the to politicians, they didn't have the privilege of your level of awareness. They are not ignorant because ignorance is a privilege. For you to be ignorant is a cluelessness in spite of training. That's ignorance. There's nations. That is a state of complete, honor. you are not even aware of what's going on. That is, you, you, you see, when, you, when you, have been, you have been trained to shoot a gun as a police officer, and then you cannot shoot the gun, you are ignorant. Because you are clueless in spite of training. There's something deeper than that. It's, that is what the people are dealing with. So, what is GDP in Ibo? What's, what's per capita income in Yoruba? What's downsizing in, in, in Ausa? So when you come and say growth, what does that mean? Jobs, multiplier effect, what does that mean? What does it even mean in Pidgin? So the courage to actually sit down and say, must we learn this way? Africans by history don't learn in classroom. We learn two true ways, key, apprenticeship and observation. It has helped us to do so many things in our history that I don't have time to articulate. And shame on everybody who manages our education for their refusal to sit down and say, it is not a problem for we to lose a war that forces us into slavery. But that the day we find independence, we must have the courage to ask ourselves who we are and how do we start again from where we stopped. We don't have to bow to the reality of the assumptions of your colonial masters or your oppressors who define how you are going to think about your life. Everything is on the table. The Americans even changed the way they used their switches. The Americans changed everything. They made sure that their colonial master, are you aware that the British government was also the colonial master of America? And that America had to sit down, not just to articulate their freedom, but to say, how do we ensure that from now we live only by our own identity and what we permit? Because only fools will complain about what they permit. Only fools. So, but in, in appreciating education and giving empowerment to people, um, I thought about a young friend of mine who could not pass English language and so could not study law, but passed economics, government, and literature with English language. <laughs> but the English language that he used to pass those three subjects, he couldn't pass it. So I said, so what is the goal of because it means that no matter what he writes in, the ex, in his exam if you cannot tell the difference between pronoun and clause or between a phrase and a clause or adjective and a pronoun it, it's not going to pass the exam no matter how clear he is no matter how well he can speak the language so what is the goal of the examiner so the examiner is not testing the use of english he's testing the technicality of english so, so the, the next question is, what is the goal of lingua franca then? Is it sophistication or communication? Because if I tell all of you now that I'm going to Lagos, you get what I mean. You get it. I don't need to say I'm going to Lagos. Now, when you define communication only by the idea of sophistication that identify elites for you and those who have some type of exposure or some privilege of background and training, you become the oppressor. Because you then deny a vast majority of people who were taught English language in Yoruba, who will never have the privilege of saying church. Once you say shosh, you cannot even marry the girl of your dreams. Because once you say shosh, the girl assumes that you are not a thinker. The girl assumes that you have no sophistication, you have no character. Meanwhile, I have Nigerians in America, I live there, who say Chicago. Chicago. It's not called Chicago. It's Chicago. But where they are coming from? To say she is Raz. And to say she is an embarrassment. So they, 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 they change it again from Chicago to Chicago. To prove that they are sophisticated. That is what is called confident ignorance. That is, you, you don't know anything but you are not aware. So you are defeated by your history and use your contest as determinant of your clarity universally wherever you find yourself. Pidgin language is not an embarrassment. It's a proof of a people's struggle with an original language. So there's Pidgin French. Pidgin, all the best soccer coaches in the world speak the worst English language. But they win all the championships. West Harworth was Nigerian's coach. Tomorrow we win Yekini's core. That's how he talks. 
but we win and we score and we get the job done. You see? Because if I say, I love you, man, and it doesn't mean, it doesn't change the quality of my thinking. It doesn't touch the size of my character. It doesn't in any way touch my ability to love or to pace you or my emotional stability and fortitude to hold your destiny in my hands and to offer you direction and help. It doesn't touch anything like that. But you will judge me for all of that just because I have the defect of birth, if there's anything like that. That doesn't allow my tongue to go shh and go shh. So, and that's the problem right there. So to so you we must turn. My fellow speakers have done an intelligent job in addressing everything about the government. I don't understand government without people. So I'm going to begin to close, but I'm going to take about five minutes more. Pastor Paul is not here. I appeal. I'm going to try and rush. I'm really struggling. So there's something called the parable. There's something I call the parable of the raw eggs. A story that I invented that a basket existed and raw eggs were in the basket. And every four years, we go to that basket to pick four eggs randomly. And when they break them into the fry pan, they are all rotting eggs. Four years after we are very angry about the first four eggs, we go to the basket again. We picked four raw eggs, put them in the fry pan, rotting eggs. We were mad this time around, went to the basket again, chose four eggs again, put them in the fry pan, rotting eggs. And for over 60 years, we have continued to go to this basket to pick eggs and break the egg in the fry pan and all the eggs have been rotting eggs. They say insanity is to do the same thing this way and get a different result. 60 years is long enough to ask ourselves that maybe this basket itself is a basket of rotting eggs. Nigerian leadership is not outsourced. It's chosen from this basket. Your leadership is not imported. There's nothing, you, you have no moral authority to hate your leadership and not hate yourself. Because everything begins with you. And if we have you in charge, thinking and accepting responsibility at a level, we will change this country. Now let me quickly move that to three basic ideas. And I'm going to do that in five minutes. The first one is stewardship of private property. The reason people make mistakes in public offices is because these are people who for 25 years of their life, or 40 years, have mastered ownership. They've mastered how to own things of private property. And it makes sense. So when somebody has mastered ownership of private property, he gets into government, and you want him to supply stewardship of public property. The common denominator there is ownership or stewardship. Forget about the property. Whether it is public property or private property, the character he has mastered will overwhelm that property. So for 40 years, this guy is a master of ownership, and justifiably so. He has created his entire life, his business, everything, mastering ownership. Nobody has questioned him or held him accountable based on stewardship. He pay, I know somebody who is very rich who pays his house help 35,000 naira. Any income you pay anybody that cannot do three things, is slavery. If the income cannot help that person to meet his basic needs in life, eating, clothing, going out. If the income cannot help him to put something away, otherwise called savings. If that income cannot help him to help somebody around him to find meaning, that is slavery. If income cannot do that, it's either you appeal to that person to support you on that job by working for you with the little you can pay, not to harass that person for paying money that is only for slaves. Assuming there's legitimacy to slavery. So the idea is ownership of private property will never deliver any society. What will deliver societies is stewardship of private property, not public property first. When you learn to be stewardship of what you seemingly own, sorry, to be a steward of what you seemingly own, then to supply stewardship of what is not yours is the easiest thing that will ever happen. And so we have to find a way to hold people accountable to how they use their personal resources. The things that they own by themselves. For example, how do you pay your staff? For example, how do you pay people around you? Critical things. 
Let me move because I see her. She's already climbing. Before she gets out, I'll finish. So the next thought for me will be, the next thought for me will be something that Dr. Um, it's, in the, it's in the rush. Don't forgive me. It's this time that is causing me. So, but Dr. Sam Amadi had emphasized. There's something we have to kill in Nigeria. And this is my last thought. If we don't kill it, we joke. And that is the concept of indigenization. Two brothers in America, one from Texas, both of them from Texas, but one was governor of Texas, another one was governor of Florida. From the same family, same mother, same father, two brothers, governor of two different states. It can never happen in Nigeria. The reason why it happened in America is because there's nothing called indigenization there. What they have in America is citizenship. Above any, it doesn't matter where you are born, if you meet the rules that define citizenship, that you can be governed. You see, the average Yoruba man like me, the average Yoruba man like me, before I am a Yoruba man, I'm first of all from Lemo. <laughs> You'll be surprised how I will defend Lemo affairs above any other thing. Then when you can minister to me as a Lemo person, then I can consider that I'm from Ogun State. Before I am from Ogun State, I'm first of all from Lemo. That's the average person I'm talking about, not me. And then, before that person is a Yoruba person, it's first of all from Ogun State. So how do you define that man who has sentiments and prejudices that transcend the limits of the identification you want him to live to, or you want him to rise to? So before he's a Nigerian, he's first of all a Yoruba man. Before he's a Yoruba man, he's first of all an Igbo man. Sorry, he's first of all an Ogun State man. Before he's from Ogun State, first of all from Lemo. You see what I'm saying? The same thing applies in the East. The same thing applies in, the, every, in Lagos, anywhere. So the idea is, how do we legislate this? That is courage. Now, the courage to actually come out boldly and say that we are going to actually legislate indigenization out of our reality. It will take a tough thing. It will take a lot of persecution. But let me tell you something about persecution. Persecution strengthens resolve, builds regimentation, and grows community. Whether it's the gay movement, or it's Christianity, or it's Islam, anything you persecute will grow. So the innovators of thought and those who campaign must be bold enough to create ideas, really, that will endure persecution. And one more minute, one more minute, one more minute, I'm getting out of your face, one more minute. I've said it before at the last platform. We need three people in any society, three groups of people, entrepreneurs above politicians. Innovators above politicians, non-profits above politicians. And that is where I want to challenge all of you. Everybody in this room, you have a personal social responsibility. It's called PSR. Forget about CSR. There's a lot of bureaucracy that defines that. PSR is tied to your will, and integrity is an act of will. Start from there and say to yourself, before you complain about what the government is doing, what do you want to do? I believe there should be about 25 different nonprofits agitating for the rights of the police force. I believe there should be about 25% agitating for the rights or the welfare of veterans in the military or the military itself. I believe there should be another rights of people fighting for the rights of children or for the sanity of families. There just have to be a way on many levels that we can identify all the problems in society and we can build nonprofits that actually challenge all of these things. Now that takes personal freedom, but that takes more than freedom, personal sacrifice. The right to say I will not be bribed is critical, but the sacrifice to say I'm willing to die for that commitment is even deeper. And so that is where sacrifice be begins from. As I close, I want you all to reflect into your own personal journey and begin to ask yourself only one question as you move towards 2023. Nigeria will change based on some existential factors. By 2030, whether we like it or not, and by 2050 by extension, three things will happen in Nigeria, whether we like it or not. I've told everyone that has come to meet me to fight for the, um, the rights of young people and to lead some campaigns that I'm not interested because nature is doing a job. Because nature is doing that job, nobody should pursue things as you should position for things. What is happening is that whether we like it or not, there is the fading of voices and powers as you know it. It's ongoing. 
There is the rise of voices and powers, as you are yet to know, is ongoing. Nature is taking care of that. In 30 years' time, Nigeria will be new. It's whether we'll be ready or not. If you are one in 30 years, you'll be 31. If you are 20 in 30 years, you'll be 50. If you are 30, you'll be 60. If you are 50, you'll be 80. If you are 60, you'll be 90. If you are 70, you'll be dead. In 30 years' time, the truth of the matter is that there is a natural flavor coming. And whether we like it or not, everybody you hate in government is going in 30 years, and most of them will take a position of weakness in society. It will be your turn to take a stand. The question should be whether you'll be ready or not. And that comes from only one thing, positioning. God bless you.